It's Platt, and today we head to the Grand Canyon State. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the particular beer we have today is Kilt Lifter from Four Peaks Brewing. A little background to Four Peaks Brewing. Four Peaks Brewing was founded by Andy Ingram and Partners in 1996 in Tempe, Arizona. They uh, located their brewery in the old Borden Milk Creamery and Ice Factory, which is only a few blocks away from Arizona State University. Uh, if I was owning a brewery, that would not be a bad location. Arizona State is known as one of the great party schools in the country, so opening a brewery there is not a terrible idea. Uh, oddly enough, though, the origins of the brewery uh, kind of date back a year before 1995. It appears Andy and the gang were able to get a hold of uh, some Grundy tanks. Now, what's a Grundy tank? Grundy tank is a variation of a bright tank, if you, if you know a little bit about uh, the brewing process. Uh, these Grundy tanks were popular in uh, the UK in the 50s and 60s, and they kind of served as, they were generally located in the cellar of these pubs, and that's where they draw the, the beer out of. Um, they were also used as conditioning tanks, sometimes as fermentation tanks. Again, similar to a bright tank here in the U.S. Well, at the time, um, the second wave of craft brewers in the 90s in the U.S. really wanted some of these tanks, and it appears that the gang at Four Peaks had access to them, flipped those, and ended up using the proceeds to fund their brewery. So I thought that's kind of a cool story. Um, the, the Four Peaks, the company started in 96, but they didn't open their doors until 97. Uh, their first beer actually was the Kelt Lifter, and that's their current flagship beer. The uh, next year, 98, they opened the restaurant part. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of these breweries, the food part, uh, helps keep the lights open. Uh, you know, it's tough to start getting those first liquor stores, other bars, but you can sell the cheese sticks to, <laughs> tomorrow. So it, it was a valuable part of their business. They also incorporated the beers into the recipes, different sauces, marinades, what have you. Um, they immediately started finding some success. Kilt Lifter started taking off as a beer to the point by 2004, they opened a second location, their Grill and Tap in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and throughout most of the early 2000s, they really kept growing uh, to the point where in 2012, they decided to open a new production facility, uh, their current production facility, I think they refer to as the Wilson facility. Uh, the next year in 2013, they opened up at Sky Harbor, the airport in Phoenix. If you're flying in and out, want a quick one, go check that out. And then in 2015, um, I guess Darth Vader would <laughs> show up, depending on how you view it. Uh, they were purchased by Anheuser-Busch. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, the pros and cons to that. Uh, quickly, let's talk about some of their other beers. Uh, they have Hop Nut, which is their West Coast-style IPA. It's their second most popular beer. Just well-executed, uh, not IPA, West Coast-style pale ale. I apologize. Um, oh, no, it is IPA. <laughs> I'm just, uh, just a well-executed beer. I'm, I'm not going to say it's groundbreaking, but well-executed beer, their second most popular beer. Uh, next, they have the Joy Bus Wow Wheat, um, which kind of makes sense. If you're brewing in Arizona, you better have some thirst-quenching beer. They, they, they can't be all big beers or, you know, high ABV, high IBU-type uh, beers necessarily. Uh, great thing about this beer is proceeds uh, from sales go to homebound cancer patients. So that's pretty cool. Uh, next, they have something called Sunbrew. It is a Col Kolsch-style ale that uh, ended up winning gold at the 2012 World Beer Cup. So that's a nice little feather in the brewer's cap. Uh, another beer there is called Rattle on Red. It is a red ale, and it was made for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Has the Even though they're called the Diamondbacks, which refers to Rattlesnake, uh, they have almost like a Cobra-style logo, and that's on the can. Real cool. Again, that's the home team. Uh, they won the World Series back in 01, I remember, so 01. So look at that. And uh, they also do, Four Peaks also does something they call their 8th Street Innovation Series. It's where they put their experimental brews. You know, they have the regular line of beers, and then when they feel creative, it goes in that 8th Street Innovation line. And last but not least, they have a line of hard seltzer. Hard, hard seltzers. I know that makes some people cringe, but... I think if I was running a brewery today, you kind of have to acknowledge that may be a line or you might have to produce some just for business sakes. Again, 
maybe for the girlfriend of the hardcore beer drinker. Again, just some, not everybody's going to drink, you know, big beers or craft beers per se. We've, we've talked about this with regular guy beers that uh, breweries put out. So I get it. Well, enough about that. Before we try this beer, let's check out the stats. All right, so I thought I'd talk about today Anheuser-Busch buying up these breweries. Again, it's a point of contention to a lot of people, especially the hardcore beer fans. Uh, a lot of people look at Anheuser-Busch, you know, kind of like the Death Star, and it's coming to destroy us. Um, and they have bought a lot of these breweries lately. Uh, Ten Barrel, Breckenridge, Elysian, of course, Four Peaks, uh, Goose Island, um, the Craft Beer Alliance, which was a group of craft breweries uh, like uh, Red Hook and Kona, whatever, that were supposedly coming together to fight the evil empire, and they ended up selling out to the evil empire, per se. Uh, as far as Anheuser-Busch's perspective on this is, they've taken these lines and created what they're called their high-end unit. And if you think about Anheuser-Busch perspectives, they have this large array of beers, you know, from the classic Bud, Bud Light, uh, to the lower end beers, your Bush, Natural Lights, whatever, their hard seltzers. So these type beers, when you're buying these breweries, they, they, they do represent the high end. And, and again, part of the thing too now is in the battle for shelf space, you know, a lot of these liquor stores are setting up separate high end shelves. Well, they're not going to put Bud, Bud Light or whatever variation on there. So I guess this is their way to get into some of these places that would naturally kind of poo-poo anything that had Budweiser on it, and I get that to a certain extent. Um, as f now, to me though, I'm I, I'm kind of I don't want to say puzzled. I'd love to talk to someone at Anheuser Busch about that because at the end of the day, they're Anheuser Busch. If you want to make a Scotch Ale, if you want to make a barley wine, if you want you you have the resources. You can you can. You have the resources to make a quality product. You have the expertise. More importantly, you also have distribution and you know economy of scale, the marketing behind it. I, I know you would never call it Budweiser Scotch Ale or something like that. I, I get that. But you could create a label, a brand, a story <laughs> real easy. Um, I, and the thing is, I, if you thought, well, all right, Anheuser-Busch is just going to throw away their research and development department and let the craft community do that. And if someone comes up with something that's successful, all right, we'll just gobble it up. But they're still developing their own uh, lines, you know, throughout the years. The Bud Dries, the Bud Ices, uh, I think I, uh, what was it, the Budweiser Black Lager, whatever I, I tried a while back. So they're still developing products, but they're also acquiring. So I, I would love to you know, talk to someone at Heinrich or Bush about how we got to that point. Um, as far as the perspective from the brewers, again, I, you know, I've talked to you before about owning a spirit company. Um, I remember telling my partners when we started, if someone walks up with us with 10 million or 20 million, I can't remember the number, I said, anybody walks up to us with 10, 20 million, we're selling out. I don't, I, I, we're cashing out, kids. You know, and we all joked, and we, but, you know, it, it's hard to tell, and we were just starting, it's hard to sell to someone that's put in 10, 15, 20 years into a brewery, and now somebody's come and can set you for life. And, and think about some of these brewers. Again, the hours you put in, you know, after 20 years, you kind of realize, oh, wait a minute, I missed my kids, you know, growing up. I've missed this, I missed this time with my wife. You know what, we've never taken that trip to Hawaii, this, that, and the other. And someone comes in and could set you for life and you could take care of your kids and grandkids, make sure everybody goes to college and your wife can have that dream house she wants. It's hard for, for those people to say no. And just, I, I hope people at least understand that part of the equation. And uh, now, and also one thing though, I do think, and rambling on about this topic a little bit, but I find it fascinating. If I was a brewer at one of these one of these breweries, the head brewer, and a lot of times Anheuser Busch comes in and does not change staff, change personnel, leaves the original owners in. If I was a head brewer at one of these places, I would kind of actually like that because you have access to the Anheuser Busch world. You know, obviously distribution is great, but access to products and and, and economies of scale when purchasing, you know, raw materials. 
Also, too, like I guess my best example is the yeast lab. If you've ever researched the yeast lab and the research they do at Anheuser Busch on yeast is incredible. And to be a brewer at one of these breweries and know that you can pick up the phone and have access to that information would be just, you know, mind boggling to me. I would love to pick their brains for hours, but I'm a nerd, so I guess that is what it is. Well, enough about Anheuser Busch. Let's drink this beer. Nice, darker copper, uh, a little darker than Sam Adams. Um, about a half a finger of light khaki head. No real hops on the nose, but you do get that classic Scotch ale maltiness. Let's... Oh, man, that's nice. You just... You get a little bit of sweetness, but real quick after that sweetness, so you start picking up those dark malts and the, you know, you'll get a little bit of the chocolate off the dark malts, but you also pick up just a hint, not very faint, but more of the kind of uh, toasted, coffee, cappuccino-like notes. It, it, it's a little more subtle in this brew than, you know, when you get to stouts and porters, but it's just there a hint. Um, this beer is easy drinking enough, but it's a little more body, a little more viscosity. Um, 6%, I don't know if it's the alcohol, but it just feels a little heartier. Um, it feels like I need to have, you know, a good bratwurst or something with this. You know, something of substance. I'm not, uh, I'm not eating hummus with this. <laughs> Nothing against hummus, but, um... A nice, solid, well-executed Scotch Ale. Um, this is, to, to me, kind of a pub-style beer, too. Again, I just sit at a bar stool and knock these back all night. Um, and what I like about this beer is, again, thinking about Arizona, where they're at. Um, they do have multiple seasons. It does get cooler down there, water, but it's generally hot a lot. But this is a beer I can still... Consume in the summertime, you know, hopefully the AC's working, but uh, it's got enough body of Warver where, again, it, it's a, it's something different. It's not a Bud Light Miller Light Warver, but still drinkable enough. Um, just like the maltiness, the, you know, the hint of the darker malts in there. Well executed, very drinkable beer. I like it. Well, I hope you like this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.